Good morning. Today is Friday, April 14th, 2023, and this is the second half of the uh, morning session for Senate Natural Resources and Energy. We're continuing our work on Bill H-158 and activating the beverage container redemption system. Um, we are going to switch up the batting order a little bit to accommodate people's schedules. Um, before we do uh, that, um, I wanted to see if Mr. our council is available online. I see Mr. Grady up on the, his name up on the screen. Um, I was wondering if you, we, we had a couple of questions that popped up related to exemptions and commerce clause. So while we're still on the topic, I thought maybe it'd be helpful to check in on that. So I don't know if you've looked at other states with bottle bills that include wine and how they're dealing with wine and maybe cider. Uh, so the, the state that I'm most familiar with is Maine. Uh, Maine has a, it does have apply their bottle bill to wine. They have uh, an exemption for, they call it the small producer exemption. It's 50,000 gallons a year of any product. So it would apply to wine or cider. Um, Etc. Maine does have a carve out from their definition of beverage for for blueberry cider and blueberry juice, and I'd have to double check, but I think they also carve out apple cider, non-alcoholic. Uh, Meaning the exemption continues beyond fifty thousand gallons. Yes, like the, if, yeah. you, if you're a blueberry juice producer in Maine, <laughs> you are not subject to it regardless of your town. Uh, I wonder if they grow any blueberries in Maine. Right. Um, I think they do. I think they do. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, thank you for that. And, and I think you... Iowa has something similar. I'm trying to check on that right now, um, uh, but I, I will have to confirm that later on. Okay, great. If you could take a look at Iowa and maybe Oregon. Um, uh, Oregon, I don't think has one, but I will double check. Okay, thank you. Um, and then because these are defined as gallonage, not uh, location, is, are we all, uh, did they not run afoul of Commerce Clause uh, provisions? No, I, I do not think you have a Commerce Clause issue. It's not discriminatory on its face against out of state producers or products. And I don't think it would be discriminatory in effect either. As the previous witness noted, there's not a lot of small manufacturers that are exporting into the state. So yeah. I don't think you have a Commerce Clause issue really at all. Okay, great. And just to make sure my note is right, you said in the main 50,000 gallons, not bottles. No, it's gallons. Yeah. Um, okay. So now, now I've learned today five bottles per gallon. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. So, I, I think I can't remember. Was it somebody said that they sell seventy thousand bottles a year or something like that? The uh, show show yeah. Well, just assuming, just for ease of calculation, that each of their bottles is a liter. 70,000 liters is 18,500 gallons. Okay, so there's still a lot of headroom um, at 50,000 more than ever. Okay, I just thanks for that uh, background information. Great. All right. Well, with that, we will um, invite uh, Ms. Segris to join us at the table. I think we've seen you yet this session, we so welcome back to the 2023 edition yes. of National Resources. <laughs> nice to see you all. Thank you for having me, and I will thank uh, the committee and Jude for uh, the accommodation. We have a very important call in a minute, so thank you again. I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, for the record, I am Erin Segrist. I'm the president of Vermont Retail and Grocers Association. Uh, our association consists of more than 750 members across the state. 
uh, which includes several types of business models, anywhere from general retail to grocery stores, convenience stores, redemption centers, distributors, food and beverage manufacturers, and business service members. So we run the gamut, and we actually um, we have members that are impacted on every side of the bottle bill. So. Um, uh, I've learned more about the bottle bill and talked more about the bottle bill than I ever thought I would in my life. Um, just under 500 of our members are food retail related members. And of those members, about 8% of them are redemption centers. Um, we did survey members uh, about their thoughts on this version of the bottle bill um, <clears throat> in the most recent survey. 95% of retailers are against expansion of the bottle bill system in its current state. 97% uh, agree that the beverage redemption system in Vermont needs to be fixed systematically. And 95% report that the third party processor continues to fail in picking up containers on a regular basis. Um, that is specifically, not just specifically, during the pandemic, but I actually received a phone call uh, two days ago from a member who uh, the third party pickup uh, processor has skipped them six times in three weeks. Um, so it's still a significant issue. Our concern is that with expansion, how are we going to address that situ situation, let alone all of the other issues <coughs> with the system. Um, can I ask you a question? Do you have written tests? You have you always have yes. good data, um, and I can't take notes fast yes. enough and listen. Yeah. Can you submit written testimony? I will. I'll yeah. apologize. I didn't send it before, but I will send it to you. Thank you. Um, so we certainly appreciate uh, the Senate Natural Resources Committee's discussion last session. I think that um, it was a, a robust discussion. Uh, I appreciate your efforts with the, the subcommittee that you created. Um, but that being said, I do we do have uh, many outstanding questions. How does commingling work within the PRO? Uh, will there be multiple commingling programs under the PRO umbrella? Are there multiple PROs? Are there two different companies, three different companies managing the system? And how will they work together? Um, who oversees the PROs? Uh, what role does retail do retailers or redemption centers have? in a PRO run system. Um, we want to make sure that retailers and redemption centers are partners within the system. Um, and does the establishment mean reduced source? We've talked about how it would mean reduced source. Um, we are well above 130 individual sorts right now in a redemption center. Um, another member shared with me that he just hired a person at $19 an hour to sort bottles. Um, we haven't seen an increase in the handling fee, the non-commingled handling fee in, I wanna say 14 years. We've been trying. We have, <laughs> um, but we've also seen a 36% increase in minimum wage since then. Yes. And we are well above minimum wage. Um, so the cost to sort continues to increase, but there's no reimbursement for the sorting. And we have more and more sorts as the years go by. So the sorting is a major issue. Um, I haven't had a moment to check, but we would urge the committee to consult with Agency of Natural Resources um, pertaining this to this bill about the at least three points of redemption per county. Um, we have concerns that that is unattainable. Uh, we continue to see redemption centers closing, not opening up. So what does that look like and how do we expect that additional redemption centers, given that you have to pay somebody 19 or $20 in an hour to sort containers, what does that look like and how is that feasible? Um, we do do, there are some redemption centers that I'm not trying to challenge your testimony, but just that say well, we can't wait till this happens because we make money being a redemption center and we'd love to have more volume. So, um, are any of those folks in Vermont Retail and Grocer Association members like are, are you getting that kind of input as well? You know, <laughs> that's the dichotomy of of the bottle bill, right? Yes, I do have members who say, I can't wait for expansion because I need more containers to make more money. Yeah. But 
I'm also being shut down three times, or I have to shut down multiple times because they aren't going to pick up my containers, right? So, you know, they want the expansion or they want it, and but they don't know how to handle it, um, or they don't want it because they know they can't handle it. And so I think if we could provide some type of clear understanding of how we would move forward, then we could have that conversation. Um, but until then, we have significant concern about sure. how to handle it, um, how to maintain the redemption centers that we have without putting them out of business, um, but also ensuring that the system works properly or whatever type of redemption system we have is the most efficient. The system we have now doesn't necessarily provide many efficiencies. Well, I knew part of, I'm sorry, that, uh, that no. part of the reason we you know, did that stakeholder group that you yeah. uh, participated in last spring was to say, okay, we do need that sort of comprehensive overhaul. So let's not let um, stores that are overly burdened by the current system like we, we need a better solution before we ever ask anyone to take more volume mm -hmm. and that was the whole impetus to go to pro and, and sort of a thoughtful comprehensive approach with a staged rollout over time with a goal of course to make sure that the system that we would adopt would fix those problems and i think the takes i suppose some act of faith to say okay the pro development process is going to yield a system that works better for in general for from our retailers and grocers. Yeah. And, and so I guess that leads me to a quick question about uh, working with ANR. So I don't know if you have in the past worked as a stakeholder in a process that's been ANR led, addressing something as, you know, that of interest to your members and how that what that experience was like. You know? Yeah. Um, so. Yes, all of the various industries that are impacted by the bottle bill. We have had several conversations with ANR. It hasn't been since before the pandemic, um, but we did have conversations. And um, I will say that we all did come to an agreement that we would increase the non commingled handling fee. Um, unfortunately, that keeps getting stuck somewhere that, that doesn't happen. Um, but that is as far as we've gone. Um, again, redemption centers, they don't want to be put out of business. If you're looking at the blue bin, you're taking 11% or more out of the blue bin in order to put it into the redemption system. Um, the haulers, we only have one hauler and they say, yeah, let's expand it because we'll make more money, but they're not picking up the product. So how can you make more money? And a sidebar on that, retailers have to, are sitting there waiting for thousands and thousands of dollars from the third party pickup company because they are picking it up, you know, so they're sitting on 15, 20, $25,000 of redeemables waiting to get that back into their, their account so that they can pay out more rede redemption. Um, you know, so it's, the system just doesn't work and, you know, the one, the one piece to circle back to your question that we all agreed on was the non-commingled handling fee needs to increase. But that's as far as we were able to to get. Um, and you know, one thing I'd ask you to do is to look at the bill and maybe give us feedback about because there is this long rollout in twenty seven about things that we can do prior to that that address you know, for instance, commingling. That could be just sooner rather than later, that kind of thing. I don't know if there are other things that you have in mind. You read the bill and say, here's an opportunity to fix something prior to seeing what a PRO driven program would look like. Yes. One question I had this morning actually was, why can't we mandate coming on now? Yeah. Everyone needs to be in the coming group now instead of in 2027. Yeah, I mean, at that, so I was thinking of was there not everything has to happen in the same year, but we want to work through the logistics of it. But the commingling fee uh, not being as widely spread from three and a half to four versus three and a half to five, it's motivating more people to join the pool. Uh, that might be something. 
I would say sooner rather than later. Yes. I just want to be careful that I'm not not thinking of something that would restrain you know would argue against that. Yeah. So just to be clear, it would be the non commingled <coughs> um, would would need the increase. If everyone yeah, was yeah. in there, then you know I'll let I'll let this committee decide if we need to increase the commingled, but yeah, non commingled. Sorry, I, mis I misspoke. Yeah, um, non commingled. If you're not going to mandate commingling, then I would say non commingled containers should be upwards of six six cents, seven cents. Push everybody in there. Okay. Um, any, uh, Senator White. Uh, no, thank you, Chair Bray. Um, so I really appreciate your testimony today. Um, and what strikes me is the third party handler piece. And normally, I understand that that's a business to business conversation where you would have a contract. So it sounds like I'm, I don't know the contracts that these grocers that or the folks that are your um, clients are, um, what kind of contracts they're writing, but that feels like a breach of contract. How, how would you recommend we as a legislature hold the third parties accountable yeah. versus maybe taking these folks to task because they're a business, right? Working with another business. Good question. So my understanding, and uh, this would be a question for the distributors and the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that the co-mingling group mm -hmm. that exists right now has a contract to pick up. Yes. Um, I don't know. If I don't know, again, this is outside of my purview. Okay. I don't know if there's a way to increase that competition. So allow allow the opportunity to have other bids come in and say, you know, I'll, I'll bid to pick up. Maybe there are multiple pickups. So it's not just one third party. Maybe there are two or three third parties because third party is coming from Massachusetts. So, yeah. you know, they're not going to make it to the Northeast Kingdom as often as they would, you know, yes, wire or junction. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's, I would suggest having a conversation with the distributors and the manufacturers. But that wouldn't be something we would legislate. That would be a conversation. No. Yeah. Okay. That would, that's, 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 that's rules for well, something I, within the coming labor. Well, I don't right. know how we would require businesses to have competition in this, you know, no. to say, yeah. 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 That's, if that's a question to have. Okay. Okay. So you're not necessarily advocating for holding the third party folks accountable, but we should talk to the distributors about that. Who represents the distributors? Uh, Leonine uh, represents the wholesale beverage distributors. Okay. Yeah. And we have um, in our next round of um, 150 testimony, we're having some results. Yeah. Have you have you ever had a conversation? Have the grocery have you ever had a conversation? What how did those were those productive? I think it goes back to it goes back to the conversations. There's similar conversations with A and R. Um, you know, everyone everyone has is impacted differently. Um, we haven't talked about the commingling. Yeah. Okay. So this hasn't about, come up yet. Right. Okay. Yeah. I don't know how we would respond to that piece, but it would be great if you could have a conversation with them because it's clearly a rub in the yeah. industry. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that would be a great place to advocate for folks. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, anything you. else before? Uh, Watson. Uh, thank you. Um, I recognize that this might be contentious point among the people that we represent, but uh, it seems to me that a solution to some of this might be reverse vending machines. You know, oh, if we're yeah. going to have multiple points of redemption in a county, reverse vending machines are, are easy. Um, is there anything that you can say or comment about reverse vending machines? Uh, so there's a lot. <laughs> um, let's see. So I know that the House Committee um, on Natural Resources has heard from a retailer in, I want to say, Morrisville, who has this amazing $100,000 system that they have. Matter of fact, he's 
He's got to talk oh, good. To yeah. So you can you talk with him. I, you know, those are very expensive. So not all retailers or redemption centers can necessarily report that or afford that. Right? There's funding sources available um, for that, right? I, I don't think there are. Not that I am fully aware of, but if there are, then I would certainly push that out to my members. I think, um, long story short or long answer short, there are a lot of questions. Yes, they're great in certain situations. They may not be for everybody. And again, the product or the containers, yes, they take up small, less space, right? But they still need to be picked up. So I think it's, yes. We There's still pick up questions. Yes, we can keep having those conversations. But I think being in the center of what he's alluding you know part of the discussion has been uh funding to support um the transition it could be automation support but certainly logistical support, <laughs> supply chain pickup has been was a problem last year um discipline to learn that even with all the conversations going on it's still a problem at least for some of your members because we just heard from the representative of that, the company that does most of the picking up that they have um, solved their supply chain problems or whatever it was that was causing less frequent pickups than yeah. uh, necessary. Yeah. All right. I, I think I will, again, thank you. Um, thank you as a committee, also you, Senator Bray, for leading uh, the conversation. I think it's been a really great conversation over the past few years. Um, again, I'll, I will send you my, my testimony that has the questions. I think there are a lot of outstanding questions that um, we, we would love to have answers to, you know, before we keep speeding down the road. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and I, you know, I appreciate that. I mean, managing risk in business is always daily. Challenge. And it's harder these right. days. <laughs> and, so. um, you know, my hope would be that the process in creating the PRO um, would be um, well managed and treat the various actors in this whole system fairly so that we hear from everyone who's got a role to play because it does touch a lot of different people. Yes. From start to finish. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Um, with that, we're going to switch to someone on the redemption side, uh, Ms. Trombley, or I have Jacob Trombley on the, on the list, but I'm not sure who we're going to hear from. Kimberly, Kimberly Trombley. Good morning. Oh, wait. all right. Oh. It's, it's a team. All right. Hey. Good morning to both of you. If you could just introduce yourselves to the committee. Um, and then we'd love to hear your thoughts about the bottle bill. And you can tell us a little bit about your business too. Hi, uh, yes, uh, I'm Jacob Trombley and this is my wife, Kim, Kimberly Trombley and uh, we own Vermont Redemption Incorporated. And I didn't go and testify in person today because I'm obviously a little sick. So my wife is going to most of the talking. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, again, Jacob and Kim Trombley, we own Vermont Redemption. We have four locations right now, um, Springfield, Bradford, Virginia, and um, Hartford. And we actually just closed um, our location in Hinesburg uh, for reasons that I'll circle to. So, um, so basically I wanted to just cover a few of the things that, um, just like the three main things that we really like about this bill. Number one, the increase in volume. Um, number two, the increase in the handling fee for non-commingle, um, which I think should be 10 cents because kind of like what Aaron just said, it really will just kind of push everybody out of that non-commingle category and into the commingle category. Um, and then, and, and those two things right there that are in the bill, really kind of solve a lot of the issues that um, redemption centers have. So it will be able to help us increase our revenue stream, which is going to allow us to pay our employees a fair wage, um, will give us the, the money to invest in technology, which again circles around to kind of solving some of these issues with space and um, you know, be, just being more efficient in general. What I would like to see in addition, um, if, if those things don't kind of 
come to fruition is you know you would have to increase the the commingling handling fee um to like probably five cents <laughs> um which nobody wants to see so <laughs> there's going to be a lot of fight back on that but um so those are just some of the things in the bill that i just wanted to kind of just say that we like agree with and things that we would like to add um in addition to that i really kind of like what uh, senator bray said about it being as easy to return a bottle as it is to buy a bottle. Um, I think that if, if that is kind of the direction that the state wants to take, um, you know, you're going to have to implement all of these things if that's what you want to do. Um, there are so many players in, in this game, right? And I know that you guys have to listen to a lot of different people, but in the end, every single person or um, company group, however you, whatever, in the end, they all chose to do business in the business that they're, you know, that they're working in, just like we chose um, the redemption business. Um, and that comes with kind of just sucking it up and, and doing the things that you have to do to make your business work, right? Um, so for example, uh, I actually have no faith that the state is going to actually kind of pull the trigger on this because if you look behind me, you can't really see it. But if you look behind me, this is actually a poster since 1934. Uh, 1993. No, yeah, 19, 1993. Uh, all <laughs> of the bills been introduced and all the way to the right, which you can't see, but it's up there. <laughs> Um, no action has been taken. So, and there's like one it, almost every single year since then. So, um, like I said, I have down the road. I have no faith in this. So I'm in nursing school right now because that's going to probably be our path of income. Um, however, if we do want to continue this talk, there are like a lot of things that I would love to just kind of throw out there. Um, one, wine being added. I can see where that is going to be really confusing because wine distributors, retailers, they're, they're everything. They have never been in this conversation with redemption. They don't understand how it works. I mean, for example, you have one guy, one gentleman there who was referring to the 15 cent deposit, which I don't know what it is. So if it is 15 cents or five cents, but was referring to the deposit as a cost when a deposit by definition is not a cost. It, it, it just goes in a circle. It's, it's something that is, you know, never gained nor, you know, lost as long as it follows its, its cycle, right? Um, however, if, if we were to say, break down the numbers just like he did, which is, I really appreciate his numbers and I'm sure you do too. But um, if you were to use his 30,000, um, bottle example at the 78% redemption rate, um, all of those numbers, what, what we would be on, on the hook for as like a redemption center, what we would be say making as like revenue from that, um, would be like roughly a thousand dollars. Okay. From that thousand dollars, just for example, it would take me, it would take me 16 man hours roughly to process that material, okay? That's two people in like say one day, okay? So that right there, $300 plus for, um, for wages, um, you know, $100 for that work day just for the mortgage. There's, you know, right there is almost half of that thousand dollars. So again, I totally understand him trying to break down the cost of doing business but everyone has to break down our cost of doing business. And we all have to kind of like decide how we're going to make our business work and run. The only difference with redemption as compared to all of the other businesses is that they can change their costs. They can change what, they, what their service or their product is worth. Our service is determined and regulated by the bottle bill. So... Mm -hmm. Everyone can kind of see where I'm going with this, right? Is anyone like, does anyone have any questions so far? Of kind of, <laughs> we're we're following. Thank you. Okay. Um. So and then I would like to touch on um a few other things like 
Um, again, Erin, you know, I totally understand. She represents the retailers. Um, I know that there are a handful of redemptions in there. There's definitely some redemptions that um, there, I would say probably all, all of her redemption centers are attached to retail. I don't know that I can't speak for her, but she probably doesn't represent any redemptions that just stand alone like we do. We don't have any retail attached to them at all. Um, and, and in terms of space, which I know a lot of redemption centers have kind of talked about not having enough space. Again, it comes down to your business model. You know, you're choosing to, to allocate all of that space to retail. You're choosing to, and, and that's, you can't, you can't say, no, don't do that. They, they should be able to do what they want to do with their business. But you also can't say, well, you know, we don't have the space, so you can't change. Um, again, if the state wants to go down this path of trying to um, recycle in the way that comes out with the cleanest, best product that can then be returned into um, the system to create cleaner um, products that just, you know, are, it's just more efficient for the processors when they, um, in the end, end point there. So um, haulers. Haulers pick up some uh, redeemables. We have haulers that bring them to us. So again, that's a business choice. If some haulers don't want to pick up these containers when they're doing curbside, that's their choice. They don't need to. Then the customer can bring it into us. Some haulers do pick these things up. Um, there's just a lot of clarifying points, but uh, that's probably not really. I don't need to like touch on everything that I've heard, but. Um, I definitely think that if anybody wants to visit any of our locations or talk more, <clears throat> we're always open. I think the only person that's ever come down to one of our redemptions and talked to us was over in the house side, Kevin, what's his name? McCart McCarty? 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 Something like that. In Springfield. Um, in Springfield. And, uh, and it was actually kind of interesting um, to hear over on the house side when we testified they had a million dollar question, right? So if there was a million dollars that we could throw at this program, you know, like, oh, where would you put it? What would you do with it? Stuff like that. And I think that uh, if, if this committee was to say, propose that same question, um, we would say the same thing that it should be put into some sort of like fund where redemption centers can borrow money to, to purchase technology that would reduce the burden because everyone, no one can find help right now. And, and that's kind of like the biggest issue that that we are faced with um, along with the cost of doing business. We're running okay. hours to just keep our redemption centers going right now because we're understaffed and the people that are there can't keep up. It's literally draining them. They're be surprised if they quit, but they don't make enough to there's no incentive for them to keep doing what they're doing, really. And they need to be paid more, yes. It's, it's, it's just, yeah. Right. Um, so you're mentioning something I haven't heard before. Are you talking about a revolving loan fund, like low-cost money that helps people invest in technology? The idea being that the increased productivity <clears throat> would pay off that loan, and if the rate's low enough, you know, you're cash flowing positive on the technology yeah. investment all the way along. Is that yeah. what you're saying? I mean, honestly, like, however it worked, I definitely think that however it ends up working should work for the program overall. If you're charging 20% interest, obviously, that is not conducive to, <laughs> like, no one is going to do that. The, they could just go get a loan at a bank. That would be, you know, so yes, a low interest rate, um, you know, and, and it being revolving, you know, revolving. So you pay it back and then there's money there again for future redemption centers to then borrow from. Um, I, you know, that's just an, an idea that came to us when the house side proposed that question. And I don't know where that came from. I have sure. no idea. But it was just interesting. And, and I, I think that that's a great idea because we actually would love to buy some technology. Um, there's definitely lots of, RVM machines and similar types like that. They don't work well. They're not efficient. We want nothing to do with them. Every time I go to a grocery store, they're broken and beeping and my cans are stepping on, my kids are stepping on cans that are in bags next to them and it's, I don't like them, but they can continue to use them if they want. That's fine. Um, 
Uh, the my husband actually visited. I think Morrisville is that is in Morrisville, yeah. and they have a great machine that works well for them. I don't think that that's what we want either. We want the bigger machines that I've actually seen out in Iowa, and apparently we can't get them. I don't know why. Yeah, I don't... have an R one machine, I believe, in in uh, Morrisville, and I think it's an E one. That Tomra makes both machines, and the E one is actually the commercial version. And we would love to invest in that and commercialize redemption, but we don't know where it's going to go. We don't. There's no incentive to do it. I mean, we can, we would love to streamline redemption like Oregon. We'd love to do it, but we can't do it on the funding that's 50 years of the same profit margins. It's just impossible. Yep. Okay. Well, we hear you there, and uh, you know the whole idea is an orderly transition. We're actually um, just so you know that we're. We're not only sitting in the building. Last year, we did a field trip to Beverage Baron, and then I went with another member of the committee up to Morrisville. We're going to hear from Mr. Hayes after you. Um, so, but, uh, you know, usually what happens is someone goes to a redemption. Actually, every member of the committee last year went to a redemption center, but they went to one near them. Yeah, I went. I've been, so I just wanted to point out, um, thank you, Trombley, so much for coming in here. I use your services in Hartford and have family that use your services in Springfield. And I think we've met before, Kimberly, um, when you came to the state house when I was a house rep. So your business- Oh, I remember you, yes. Yes, I yes. Do remember. Did you change yeah. your hair? I did, I no longer a blonde. Um, okay. Yes, I was going to say you had blonde hair. <laughs> but so, but we do. I know. I know. <laughs> Chris, you know, he, he's a bottle blonde too. Um, I remember you now. Yeah. But yeah. we do so appreciate your work and it's really refreshing. And I just want to say that um, the frustration that you feel about the delay in the bill and the fact that it is not moved forward and the chart behind you, which if you have a copy of the chart behind you, that's readable, I would happily look at it. Um, but that is, you are not alone in that frustration, although you are the one most acutely feeling the impact of it. So thank you for continuing to advocate. Well, if you use Hartford Redemption, you understand how inefficient our redemption has been there because we have not been able to find the help. And we yes. have the gentleman that's there right now who's doing an awesome job. Who has great but, music. Yeah, he, but he... He has his children to pick up, so we have to close it too. He can't be there on Wednesdays, and we're only there for a limited time on Saturdays. We'd love yeah. to be open seven days a week. People would love it there. Yeah, and yeah. it's just crazy. <laughs> yes. With those limited hours, how long a wait do you usually? You end up with a wait a line. Yeah, or he's not? got. He's one person. He cannot find help, and there's nine or ten cars in line. And he has to lock the door at two because he tried to go out to explain to people that he has to go get his children and people are mad and upset and <laughs> we get it, but it's like, what do we do? We, we, we can't hire anybody. I live two hours from the redemption. I went there and I worked there for six months last year to keep it open, just gone all week long. And I finally found Micah and he's doing a great job, but he can only work so much and I can't hire a part-timer because Nobody wants to work. Yep, yep. The okay. center is limited so, hours because of that. Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, well, thanks for what you're doing. And last question to uh, Senator Watson. Here. Thank you. Uh, so I, I think I might have missed this, but what is the name of the machine that you were describing that you can't seem to get here in Vermont, but it exists in Iowa? Okay, I'm gonna look at so the one that so the one that I saw I I, I said oh. similar to the one in Iowa. So the one that I saw, um, so I have family out in the Midwest and just you know curious entrepreneurial me was like, let me go look at a redemption center and check this place out because it's um it, it's just really busy and around like it, I don't know if anybody really knows a lot about Iowa, but it's like you have populations <coughs> in about three places, right? You know, all the way on the west side, suit, so, yeah, and then Iowa City, anyways. So, um, so I went and checked it out and this place is just massive, has like great equipment. It's just totally streamlined. We've implemented some of the things that, he, um, that he did that worked really well. And I was like, we're going to do that. So we've changed some things, um, in, in our places. And I mean, I'd love to go back there and see what he's done now, but that was a few years ago. But I think it's called like the E1 or something like that. Like my husband can email it to you after 
Exactly. Great. That would be great. Um, along Thank with the so picture yeah. behind us. All right. Yeah, picture Perfect. and the machine, that will be great. Thanks so much for your testimony and thanks for um, your role in the whole redemption system. Thank you for your time. And I know that I sound a little kind of like short and brash about things, but <laughs> it just is what it is. So yeah. appreciate well, it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, we'll go to Mr. Hayes. Good morning, Mr. Hayes. Good morning. I'm well, um, thank you. So if you could just introduce yourself to the committee, and um, I think you and the facility that Senator Westman and I came up and visited last spring. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, good morning. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. My name is Ethan Hayes, and I'm the general manager of Morrisville Beverage. We're an independent beverage store, Vermont Liquor Agency, and a certified bottle redemption center. Uh, we process approximately 4.8 million deposit containers per year. Um, we're in support of H-158, the expansion of additional containers into the deposit system. We believe, as others said, that keeping more containers in the closed loop benefits the environment, reduces supply chain issues, and provides an incentive for Vermonters to recycle their containers, unlike the single stream bins. In 2021, our company invested significantly in upgrading our facility and purchased new bulk reverse vending technology uh, to allow us to process an additional volume of containers, increase efficiency, and reduce fraud. Prior to 2021, we were a hand count only facility, just like pretty much every other redemption center in Vermont with two full-time employees. Uh, unlike traditional RVMs, the new model, which you've heard several others speak about ours, uh, it allows customers to redeem up to 100 plus aluminum cans and plastic bottles combined at once, reducing wait times, accounting for the many brands and container sizes. This process reduces the amount of square footage dedicated to sorting and bagging as the machine compacts and crushes all the containers and provides an accurate count to the pickup agent. The containers are automatically sorted by material type, dropped into bins for ease of pickup. We still employ all the same employees we had prior to our upgrades. We pay them well above minimum wage, but instead of spending hours sorting through the hundreds of distributor sorts, our employees are now assisting customers much more directly, maintaining a cleaner facility and providing much needed labor in the front of our store. Uh, we've also instituted bag drop service and established relationships with several charity groups for bottle drives and pickups uh, at their drop-off locations. Our investment in the new technology has allowed us to be prepared for an increased volume of containers that the expanded bottle bill would cover. It helps us reduce fraud by using barcodes to verify if a container is in fact redeemable. Uh, provisions in H-158 assist in this process by requiring those barcodes and UPCs to be placed on all products. Um, one thing we believe is it may be beneficial, and I know that Trump has kind of touched on something along this line, for a grant program or some other funding source to be established to assist redemption centers in upgrading their facilities to these new technologies, implementing RVMs, and even opening new points of redemption in underserved areas. Enacting H-158 will move the bottle bill to the modern era, help Vermont do its part in closing the loop, engage distributors, manufacturers, producers in the process, make redemption convenient and sustainable into the future. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Great. Um, well, thanks. Um, it's, uh, the, going to your redemption center was a, a very different experience than what I'm used to. You know? opening the big door, pouring in all the bottles, away it goes. Um, can you talk a little bit about the cost of making that investment, if you don't mind, so that we have sense, some sense of scale for <clears throat> what it costs to stand up one of these automated centers? Yeah, sure. We, uh, we went all in on this project and not just purchasing the machinery, but we upgraded the entire uh, bottle room experience to you know a much cleaner atmosphere. We rebuilt, we repainted, redid our floors, designed things differently uh, to make it not uh, seem so kind of dirty and grungy and going in and what's associated with a typical bottle room and to make it a much cleaner experience. So there was construction costs, several tens of thousand dollars involved in that with putting up some walls, again, redoing floors, and then ultimately purchasing the machines. Uh, that is a couple hundred thousand dollar investment um, for what we did. It this RVM is is 
the latest and greatest, so to speak. It's not the typical stuff that you see at the grocery store where you're standing there putting in one container at a time. It's a bulk reverse vending machine. So there is a significant cost that comes along with that. Um, but again, we were in the couple, we were in the couple hundred thousand dollar range to do all the upgrades that we wanted to do. Okay, so the, the machine costs, because and I remember you had two, you had one large RBM for plastic and cans, and then you had another one for glass. That's correct. That's correct. So the large RVM, which is called the R1, that is for cans and plastic. Uh, that machine is a little over $100,000 just by itself. And then there's the smaller machine, which is the single standalone one container at a time that handles the glass. Uh, and uh, that machine is, a, I believe we were in the twenty-five or so thousand dollar range. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, you, it's definitely a very different experience. Yes, and I encourage anybody that wants to see it, uh, feel free to reach out to me and you can come visit anytime. We're glad to give you a tour and, and show you all the nuts and bolts. Um, so one of the things we talked about was the difficulty for merchants to handle redemption. And we talked last year um, about the notion of you might be sort of a processing hub for a number of stores in the area. So they could simply... <clears throat> who knows the exact logistics so basically they'd be collecting but all the redemption would happen at, on, at your site um have you explored that with local merchants or anyone in your area is anyone interested in signing up for that kind of a relationship we haven't really explored it and nobody's really approached me about it we've had some conversations with some of the local solid waste districts about how they're operating and things that we could do to assist them um mm -hmm whether that means uh, having charity groups setting up bins at their locations so that uh, people could drop off all their redeemables in that location and we go and, and go and collect those. We do have that now at a couple transfer stations where um, there is a, a nonprofit that has a bin there where folks can drop off all their redeemables and we go out with our trailer and we pick all those up and bring them back here and process it. Um, but we haven't had anything formal with any other retailers. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Um, and if, as you look ahead, what's on the horizon? Do you have, does this investment mean that you're set for the foreseeable future or you feel like, oh, well, there's a next stage and here's what it is? Uh, we are for right now. We, we've seen an increase in volume since we installed the machine. We're up quite a bit in the amount that we are processing. We know that if the bottle bill goes through and the, the amount of containers that are redeemed are doubled, we would have to look at adding a second machine. We have the space to do that now. Um, and if it, there are ways for us to expand within our footprint that we have if we need to. Okay. One um, of the other redemption uh, challenges is pickup. Um, so your machine crushes everything. So the volume is a lot smaller. You have those Gaylords. Um, are you getting timely pickup on those material, those bins? I would say 95% of the time, yes. There is occasion where something happens. Um, we generally have good communication with the depot and the manager there, and he is able to reach out to us or we reach out to him if there's an issue. Our, our drivers are really good that we have, so they let us know if, hey, I'm going to be on vacation this week, so-and-so is going to be coming. It might be at a different time. We have a good working relationship with them, um, and, and we have. There were times specifically during the pandemic when things got really rough, those challenges have mostly been worked out for us in our own experience. Okay, great. Good to know. All right. Um, any uh, committee questions for Mr. Hayes before we go on? All right. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. With that, we'll go to um, Paul Tomasi if he is here. He's not. I'm not seeing Paul no. uh, from the NEK Waste Management District. Um, and Ms. Holiday from Chittenden South Waste. So good morning to you. There we go. Good morning. Thank you Hi. for joining us. Yeah, sorry. Um, I didn't expect to be up so quickly, but thank you, um, Chairman Bray, committee members. Nice to see you. And thank you for inviting me to speak about um, H158. For the record, I'm Jen Holliday. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Communications for the Chittenden Solid Waste District. 
Um, CSWD is a municipality. We oversee solid waste management for our member towns, which is all of Chittenden County. We're managed by a board of commissioners that is made up of one representative from each member town. And our mission is to reduce and manage the solid waste generated within Chittenden County in an environmentally sound, efficient, effective, and economic, economical manner. Our work focuses around helping our members produce less waste and diverting as much as possible from the landfill. And to do this, we provide education and outreach to school children, business owners, institutions, and the public about waste reduction and diversion opportunities. We also enact policy through our ordinance with requirements such as mandatory recycling that we've had in place since 1993. And we advocate for state policies to further our mission, such as producer responsibility laws and the universal recycling law. Our facilities provide opportunities for proper management and diversion of waste and include six drop-off centers, a hazardous waste facility, an organics recycling facility, and a materials recycling facility, or MRF. And so it's the MRF that is most germane to the topic of the day. So that is what I'll focus on. Um, our MRF uh, is a regional facility that services haulers beyond Chittenden County. We process about 49,000 tons of recyclables every year, which is over 50% of the blue bin recyclables generated in Vermont. We contract with Casella to operate um, the MRF, um, but we own the equipment and building. So this MRF that we're currently using is uh, a little, is, is, is 30 years old. It's really outdated, has no modern technology. It's inefficient and it's absolutely at maximum capacity. So our board um, made the decision to replace it with a new modern facility to ensure that our community will have a local affordable outlet for their recyclables for the next 30 years. And last November, uh, the Chittenden County voters approved CSWD to borrow $22 million for this $26 million project. The new MRF is gonna be built on land that we already own on Redmond Road in Williston. It will be equipped with new mo modern technology and it will be more efficient and accurately sort material to provide even higher quality recyclables to market. It will also provide better working conditions for the employees and the capacity will be up to 70,000 tons of recyclables per year with ample room for growth. We anticipate that the new MRF will be online in early summer of 2025. So there's two sources of revenue to pay for the cost of running our MRF. We have tip fees that we charge the haulers to drop off their recyclables. It's currently at $80 per ton. And then we have the sales of processed recyclables, which fluctuates with the commodities market. And to give you an example of this fluctuation, paper prices last fiscal year, um, we received on average $82.21 a ton. Um, in March of this year, the price of paper that we received was $1.26 per ton. And over 75% of the material we process at the MRF is fiber, either cardboard or paper. Glass makes up about 12 to 14%, and then the remaining is plastic and metal containers. So when the prices, is, prices are down on things like paper, we rely on the higher value material to cover the loss, which um, is impacted. Um, it, it, it includes PET and aluminum, um, which PET and aluminum together only um, make up, they make up less than 4% of the material we process. However, they are the, some of the highest value material and account for close to 20% of the total revenue from sales of, of our recyclables in 2022. Um, glass is a, a different story. Um, it's the most difficult and expensive material for us to manage and market. It's abrasive, it's hard on the equipment, and it requires a significant amount of screening to remove contaminants. Due to the difficult nature of managing glass and single stream recycling, we do support policies that both divert glass 
from the landfill and remove it from the MRF, including an expansion of the bottle bill on wine. Um, we, Ms. Holliday, can yeah. I jump in? A couple sure. questions that keep up. Um, so paper was 80, $82 a ton, and then it went to one. And yep. what was the time frame from 82 to one? How so, so the $82 uh, per ton is the average of the entire fiscal year of um, FY22. Uh -huh. um, and um, we are seeing, uh, we, we started seeing a decline in paper prices last summer, which was beyond FY22, it's FY23. And they have steadily decreased since that time. So the, it's been on the decline since around uh, August or September of last year. And you're currently at a $1. In March, our latest data shows in March, yeah, it was a dollar twenty-six per ton we were receiving. Yeah, mm -hmm. and this, yeah, it's it's very dramatic, and, and it has this has occurred um, in the past as well. Um, there's a you know there it fluctuates because there's a a glut in the market and maybe a decrease in um, in product uh, products being made. So that that. That's why we have fluctuations. Sure. Um, and just so that the members I have are filling some of the blanks. So the recycled value per ton of um, polyethylene, whatever it is, P-E-T-E, P-E-T, uh, sorry. The, uh, <coughs> what's, what's the value of that in the marketplace per ton about? Um, I can look at that very quickly. Um, last year, I'm looking at a table, it was very high. It was about, it was on average um, $600, $600 a ton. I think currently it's somewhere around $225 or $250 a ton. Okay, great. I'm just trying to, so it's sense of scale. Uh, yep. How about aluminum? Aluminum? Yeah. Aluminum um, is around fifteen hundred dollars a ton. Okay, great. And then glass. I don't know if glass is has a positive or negative value per ton. Glass is negative. Um, we actually have to um, manage the glass. Casella does not manage it for us. They they produce a uh, processed glass aggregate at the facility, but then um, we have to find the market for it. And uh, we ha we pay on average, it depends on where it goes, but we pay for transportation and receive no revenue. So on average, we're paying about $40 a ton between the places we pr have to transport it to. Okay, and where, can you just say briefly what uses this glass aggregates put to these days? Yeah, so that was in my testimony. Um, I'll just uh, go through that. We um, we receive the glass at our MRF, we crush it, we screen it several times, we make the process glass aggregate, we regularly sample and test it to ensure it meets the specifications for ANR's PGA approved uses. And then um, we send it, if it does, we send it to a local quarry where it's mixed with sand for use in construction. And um, the glass that doesn't pass the PGA specifications, which primarily is in the winter because half of our processing of glass is located outdoors at our new MRF, that will be a different situation and we can't screen it enough to get it clean. Um, when that occurs, we ship it down to strategic materials in Windsor, Connecticut, and um, their strategic materials cleans it up and uses it to make new glass bottles and fiberglass. Okay. Um, and then there is, for years, as you know, we've had the conversation with Glavall, I think is the name, the right. Vermont manufacturer of uh, that constru I don't know, construction materials using right. glass. Uh, have, have they become a market for your PGA? They have not um, become a market for our PGA. 
Mm -hmm. Gravel needs uh, extremely, um, I believe they need something that is very pure and they purchase um, glass out of Canada. Uh, they've talked about potentially taking our glass and cleaning it up to meet their specifications, but I think their equipment is very expensive, expensive and sensitive. And so at this point, they're not, they're not taking our glass. Okay. Um, and, you know, I'm sorry I'm asking questions. I haven't looked at your written testimony, so if there's a lot more detail in there, but uh, I will not ask the, the detailed questions. Yes. Um, do we have I, I, I do have some more testimony to, to, to provide, and I do have it written. I, I'm sorry I didn't have it written in time to submit in advance, but I will submit that after, I, after today. Um, I just wanna talk a little bit about the impact of Act 158 um, on, on, on the MRF and, and that we, we do recognize that bottle bills, um, this, the, the bottle bill is very successful at diverting material from the landfill. And we do support successful diversion programs and have never advocated to eliminate Vermont's bottle bill. But it's important to recognize that the bottle bill was created in the 70s before there were any meaningful recycling program. And now thanks to you and your predecessors, we have other effective waste diversion policies such as the universal recycling law, law which mandates recycling of blue bin materials. Um, and um, as a result, Vermonters are recycling blue bin materials at rates comparable to the bottle bill recycling rates. And I think you've, you may have heard different data, but um, according to ANR's 2021 biannual report on solid waste, a key takeaway was that the universal recycling law was working and that Vermonters recycle 72% of mandated blue bin recyclables. And in that same document, it reported that the bottle bill redemption rate was at 75% for that same year. <laughs> So both these policies have been very successful at diverting recyclable material from the landfill. So our primary concern with um, H158 is the expansion that includes PET and alum aluminum because it will decrease the revenue for MRFs in Vermont and it will result in uh, tip fee increases that will be passed on to Vermonters. We assume there will be a high rate of redemption because H158 automatically increases the deposit if a high rate is not achieved. Um, and if the current rate of a redemption is 75% and the PRO is required to ultimately achieve 90%, we will lose not only the materials that are in the expansion that currently go to, the, to our MRF, but also materials that are already in the current bottle bill system, but are recycled by consumers through the blue bin system. We estimate the net revenue loss at our MRF from an expansion will require us to increase the tip fee by between $8 and $16 per ton. And that, in, that calculation includes the loss of aluminum and PET, but it also factors in the loss of glass from the inclusion of wine which does help offset some of the revenue loss from the PET and the aluminum. If the expansion stays in the bill, we urge the committee to keep wine in. I will also note that Susan Collins testimony showed a calculation of CSWD's revenue loss that only included the tip fee loss from tonnage loss and did not include commodity revenue loss. The expense for the hauler will not be made up by the hauling by them hauling less material as she reported. Um, I will also point out that an expansion of the bottle bill is not going to increase diversion from the landfill. According to the 2018 Vermont Waste Characterization Study, only 1.1% of the material being landfilled is beverage containers that would be subject to an expanded bottle bill similar to H158. This is because beverage containers are already being recovered at a very high rate through the existing systems. Our concern is that expansion will increase the cost of recycling without gaining additional diversion. And just finally, I just I would like to the opportunity to correct some misstatements made by other witnesses about single stream recycling. 
claims have been, been made that MRF recyclables are not high enough quality to be made into beverage containers and are downcycled. These statements are based on speculation and are not based on scientific analysis of Vermont's MRF materials. The aluminum and PET and glass that is processed at our MRF does get sold to end markets that utilize this material to make new beverage containers, just like the bottle build material. Um, furthermore, aluminum cans can be recycled endlessly. Aluminum itself can be recycled endlessly. It's not better for the environment for aluminum from a beverage can to be made into another beverage can versus a durable product, such as a car part that lasts many years and can be recycled again. Um, and then lastly, the, the, the statement that MRFs are losing 25% of the aluminum is absolutely not the case for our, our MRF. And I question that data point coming, where that's coming from. Um, at $1,500 per ton, it's the highest value commodity that we take in um, and the lowest volume. And I assure you, we're, we're making sure that aluminum is being captured. So that's what I had for my entire testimony. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, if you can um, send your testimony when you're ready, that would be great, just because yeah. you always have facts and figures, and I want to make sure we get them right. Um, Senator White. Uh, thank you, Chair Bray. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Holiday, for um, joining us today and uh, presenting from the perspective of, um, of your organization. Uh, so I have a question because in previous house testimony on this bill, my understanding is you had said the increase for the tipping fee was six to ten dollars. I'm wondering the number I heard was just different that you said. So has has that changed? So I guess it's a twofold question: why the change, or was it wrong in the house, or do you have data now to back up kind of that increase and? So clarity around the tipping fee piece. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, so when I estimated that uh, figure in the house, one of the things I did not include was the, um, the, the, the share of the commodity value that is received by Casella. So our contract currently is that Casella receives 50% of um, of the commodity value. And um, in looking at that with uh, other folks in our organization, they pointed out that Costella will have to increase their processing costs to cover the loss of that revenue. So we should be putting in the full uh, value of the commodity loss, not just the 50% that uh, CSWD receives. So that's the primary difference in that estimation. Are you able to share that with us? Kind of the sure. calculation. That would be really helpful for me. Sure. Happy Thank to. You. And okay, so that explains the difference in the numbers. Um, so that's really all I had. All right. So the um, you're, I, I don't quite have it straight what the relationship is financially with Casella. There, I can really, I can explain that if you'd like. Sure, because that, okay. that would be helpful. Yeah, so um, CSWD sets the tip fee, and we receive the tip fee revenue. Um, we pay Casella a per ton fee to process the material that comes in the door. And then the revenue from the sales of commodities is shared between Casella and CSWD, a 50-50 split essentially. And the um, glass is is the cost of managing the glasses is all on CSWD. Okay, great, that's helpful. And so the that 
eight to 15 per ton. So includes not just losing the 50% revenues that you would have otherwise made because some materials will no longer be coming to you. You're saying that Casal is telling you they're going to raise their rates to, uh, to make up for their loss of 50% of the commodity revenue. We, yeah, and we have not present contractual. I'm just saying about we will have to sell in so we can ask them the same thing. But I'm just wondering, is that speculative that you'll end up being charged more by them, or they already articulated that, or is it a contractual yeah. provision? So we haven't had this conversation with them, but they will lose, you know, by estimation, they're going to lose 300 over $300,000 by our estimation. And we're, we're assuming that they will raise their processing fee to cover that, at least some of that loss, if not all of that loss. Okay. So they would lose 300. So I guess that means that you would lose, would also lose 300. So it's minus 600 in terms of commodity revenues right. loss. Or gone if the bottle bill means fewer materials ever reach you. Right. And the calculation shows that we do have a savings both from glass um, and not having to manage as much of that, but also we're we don't have to pay Casella to process that material that tonnage, right? So there is that that's part of the calculation as well. Um, but the, but the net at the end is is a is a loss of about three hundred thousand dollars between the two of us. I mean, okay. for, for each of us. Yeah, uh, Senator Watson. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, you all are in the process of building a, a new facility. Um, yeah. Are you building this facility with the assumption that this uh, bill will pass and you'll have a smaller volume of materials to be processing, or are you assuming that it will not pass and uh, you're going to uh, need to continue to um, process a, a much larger volume? Or maybe that's a premature question. Um, uh, uh, maybe, I don't know where you're at in your process of planning. Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, I, I The answer is really neither. We're building the facility because we need a new materials recovery facility. It's being designed to accommodate a capacity that we uh, think we will need over the next 30 years with or without an expansion of the bottle bill. Um, packaging changes a lot and there's it's really hard to predict what we're going to be managing and what we're going, you know, how, what, what those materials will be in 20 years, but uh, we need, we absolutely had to replace this mark or we were going to have to transport it somewhere far away for processing. So we. Thank you. That makes sense. Um, especially since like 75% of your material um, is, uh, you know, paper and cardboard. Uh, you know, I, I'm wondering, I mean, if this passes, if you all will be able to save some costs on manufacture on, on building this new facility, knowing that the stream of materials will be less. No, the square footage of our facility won't change. Okay. All right. Thank you. Right. Um, any other committee questions for Ms. Holiday? Um, I do. Since uh, quick last question, the PCA. Uh, so is the Casella facility now um, reliably able to meet the ANR specs or the VTrans spec for PGA? And is it going into roadbeds or is right. it found at last? I guess that's my question. Yeah, um, we are consistently, or Casella is consistently meeting the specifications during the the drier months. Um, or the, the warmer months. And uh, as I said, we're consistently testing that. Uh, we are working with the Agency of Transportation and UVM um, 
and ANR to look at replacing sand borrow, which is used in AOT projects and is a naturally occurring resource in Vermont that's been depleted and they now have to truck in sand borrow to use on their road construction projects. And AOT is happy with uh, the quality of the glass and, and ready to move forward with using it as a replacement. We're still waiting for approval from the Agency of Natural Resources. Okay, so it's not quite a done deal yet. You, there's an AMR sign off yet to come. Right, yeah. Okay. Well, luckily we're in the patience business because <laughs> for all of us, I guess we've been trying to, we've been close to this finish line for several years. I, so I, this, we're not quite there yet. And I think we'll, we'll want to ask AR so we can learn more. Senator White, last question. Oh, um, so just kind of going back to the numbers really quick. I'm wondering if you're doing your calculations based off the 90% uh, idea, which is required by 2040, rather than kind of the expectations before that and how you're doing your calculations. And maybe we'll see that in what you send us. But from my understanding, that's not till that's 17 years from now. So the 90% the diversion. Yeah. yeah. So my calculations are not using 90% of loss of material. Because okay. um, okay. we, we will, we're still going to get people using the blue van. Um, yeah regardless of the expansion and the deposit. Okay, so I'll but look the, out. But, but the increase of the 10, 10 cents will happen relatively quickly. <laughs> um, it's not gonna be that number of years that you had indicated the automatic increase to 10 cents is um, in the first five years. Yes. Okay. So I'll do, I'll review the what you share with us, um, and then you know I do have some questions around just the um, the commodity value of paper too. So I'll look out for that. Thank you. All right. So good to see you again. Thanks for the information. Thank we'll you. Watch your, um, digital um, testimony, which we'll also put up on the website, so anyone watching uh, can have access to that as well.